Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots, and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices. Real experiences. Raw conversation. One destination for it all. E360 TV. amazing phenomenal leaders welcome 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 to the new era of consciousness here on take the lead a consciousness movement with angelique kapoor now as you may well know by now i am your host angelique kapoor i'm a conscious leadership coach and empowerment strategist a multi-book author inspirational speaker as well as the founder of oversight global where myself and my awesome team are on a mission to address the consciousness crisis in the world one leader at a time. 
Now, did you guys get to experience the solar eclipse today? So NASA was predicting that this solar eclipse would overshadow the last total eclipse across the U.S. that occurred back in 2017 in almost every way. They expected the path of the eclipse to cross more major population centers than the eclipse in 2017, enabling a 31.6 million people to see the eclipse without having to leave their cities versus just 12 million that were able to do that in 2017. Now, one of the most entrancing parts of a total eclipse is the view of the sun's corona during totality. So in the eclipse today, the sun entered one of its most active periods, known as a solar maximum, which provided a much greater show of activity from the corona than the eclipse back in 2017 when we were near a solar minimum. So a bit of science there for you. I hope that you were able to experience a bit of it today as the next total solar eclipse that can be seen from the U.S. is not expected to happen again until August of 2044. Now, did you happen to see the rather catchy commercial at the start of the show for our newly redesigned website? Whoop, whoop. Yep, our new website is finally launched. And I just have to say that I am so blown away by all of you who have, who have already gone and checked it out. We got over 2.29 thousand views in less than a week. I can't even believe it. So if you haven't already, be sure to go and check it out at www.oversightglobal.com. It's been a lot of work in the making, and I'm so excited that it's live. Our web designer that we worked with, Blanca at Revolutionizer, did an absolutely fabulous job. So what are you waiting for? Go over there and check it out already. Now, if you caught our last episode last week, I'm sure you were just absolutely blown away by our guest, Caden McElwain, who we had on the show. He is an inspiring autistic college student, writer, author, as well as an activist. Now, the month of April is actually Autistic Awareness Month, which synergizes perfectly with having Caden on the show last week. Now, because I and my team at Oversight Global want to assist in the, in the movement to promote inclusion, acceptance, and support with people with autism, we're actually running a special campaign all this month of April where we will be donating all proceeds from the sales of any versions of my books. So Mindset, The Power of the Mind, Leader Mindset Activation, and the Leader Mindset Activation Accompanying Workbook. So we'll donate the proceeds to those to an autism organization, the Lake County Special Needs Birthday Club, which is the organization that Caden has a personal goal this year of raising at least $5,000 for them. So let's help them out, all you amazing, phenomenal leaders out there. These books provide powerful tools and strategies to help individuals like you transform from merely managing the different aspects of your life to truly leading, as well as cultivating a mindset for success and taking control of your destiny. So take advantage of this opportunity this month to not only enhance and accelerate your own personal growth and development, but simultaneously help to bring additional resources to the movement to expand autism awareness. So be sure to tell all of your friends, family, and colleagues as well. Just go to the link that's on your screen now to purchase any or maybe even all of my books today. Now, if you'll remember from our premiere episode in this show segment, Leading Yourself, a Daily Review, this is where we go beyond the basics of self-leadership and dive into practical tips and strategies that you can apply to your daily routine. Now, we all have good and bad days, but what's important is how we learn from them. By analyzing our successes and failures, we can identify areas where we can improve and take charge of our life. Now, this will help you to develop a growth mindset, allowing you to face challenges with confidence and determination. Okay, so break out your journal or pen and a piece of paper so we can actually put the segment into action. So go ahead and start off. We'll go ahead and start off today's show by reflecting on your day that you had today. 
Now to do this properly, let's go ahead and have you sit up straight and close your eyes if it is safe for you to do so. If you're driving or operating heavy machinery, please wait to join us for this exercise until another time when you can safely participate. So go ahead, close your eyes, sit up straight, and start to take three slow, deep breaths, and then let those breaths start to relax you. Now with each exhale, release any tension that you might have in your neck, your shoulders, and anywhere else that you might have tension. Now as you relax, start to focus on the present moment by focusing on your breathing. Now, if any thoughts come up, just let them float by so that you, as you can address those later. But right now, we want you to be in the present moment. So take another deep breath and release any more tension and really sink into that relaxation. And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. Now, how does that feel? Pretty awesome, right? Okay, now on with this daily review exercise. So now that we've got you relaxed and focused, think about the day that you had today, or if you're watching this first thing in the morning, think about the day that you had yesterday. Now, instead of thinking about tasks or events, think about your state of being. Now, how was your attitude today? Were you in good spirits or were you feeling overwhelmed and stressed out? Now, how about your time management and productivity? Did you have a nice steady pace throughout the day? Were you able to get things done in a calm and satisfying manner? Or did you spend all day rushing through your day and didn't even get to completing most of your tasks? Now, we don't have time to complete this exercise during the show, but I want you to take this awareness of your daily review and explore why you were in the particular state that you were in today. Think about how you can improve your day moving forward or how you can continue to have a great day if you had a great day today. Now work on this over the next week and we'll dive deeper into this daily review exercise next time we have this segment. Okay, so it is monologue time. So to kick off my monologue today, I want to recognize an upcoming holiday that's coming up this week. So coming up on April 10th this week is National Siblings Day. So here's a pic of me with both of my brothers. So if they're watching, they're probably horrified right now. So if you have brothers and sisters, be sure to give them a call or better yet, spend the day with them. Siblings are an incredible gift and anyone who has a brother or sister or brothers and sisters should not let the day just pass by without celebrating them. Now, I was an only child until I was about 10 years old, and I frequently joke that life was so much better than that time, but in all honesty, it was really lonely growing up being an only child for that stretch of time. I'm definitely grateful for both of my brothers that I have, and will definitely be giving them both a call on April 10th. Okay, so you may remember that back a couple episodes ago, I did my first monologue and mentioned that a subject that seems to keep coming up in conversations with people lately is narcissism. Now, personally, I don't particularly like that word. I just find it to have a very rough, dark energy, which is why I don't like using the word very often. But anyhow, narcissism is defined as a personality trait characterized by an excessive sense of self-importance, a lack of empathy for others, and a need for admiration. Now, those who exhibit narcissistic tendencies also often have a deep-seated belief in their own superiority and feel entitled to special treatment and attention. Now, they may also display a lack of regard for the feelings, needs, and desires of others, viewing them only in terms of how they can serve their own interest. Now, the prevalence of narcissism in contemporary society is a topic of much debate and discussion. Now, some argue that social media has fueled a culture of self-absorption and self-promotion, leading more people to exhibit narcissistic traits. Now, others point to increasing emphasis on individual success and achievement in modern society as a contributing factor as well. Whatever the cause, it's clear that narcissism is a widespread phenomenon that is affecting individuals and institutions across all sectors of our society. 
The link between narcissism and leadership, though, cannot be ignored. Now, many leaders in high positions across every sector exhibit narcissistic tendencies, which can have serious consequences for their organizations and the people that they serve. The uh, narcissistic uh, leaders may be more focused on their own goals and desires than on the needs of their followers, leading to a lack of trust, poor decision making, and even organizational failure. It is therefore important for organizations to be aware of these tendencies and take steps to manage them, such as implementing leadership development programs that focus on empathy, self-awareness, and emotional intelligence. I'm actually a huge advocate for this type of movement. In addition to these institutional initi initiatives, addressing the consciousness crisis that underlies narcissism is also crucial. Individuals must become more aware of their own tendencies towards self-absorption and work to cultivate a more empathetic and compassionate approach to life. Now, this can be achieved through practices such as mindfulness, meditation, therapy, and self-reflection. Now, by recognizing and managing our own narcissistic tendencies, we can create a more harmonious and compassionate, compassionate society, one in which leaders are focused on serving the greater good rather than their own egos and personal agendas. And with that, what are your thoughts or questions on my monologue today? Let me know by emailing me at admin at oversightglobal.com. All right. Now, today we were originally scheduled to chat with the inspiring father, entrepreneur, and community activist Ashton Young and hear his inspiring story of self-love. However, Ashton is not feeling well today and is unable to join us on the show. So we're sending him prayers and healing energy for a speedy recovery. So I'm excited to bring on to the show for the first time, but I'm sure you'll be seeing lots more of him, my partner in crime, Kamal Kapoor. Now, Kamal is actually the COO of my leadership coaching company, Oversight Global. He's also the magician behind the scenes of the show every week, as he's also our production engineer and, most importantly, my amazing husband. So, phenomenal leaders, please help me welcome my esteemed guest co-host today, Kamal Kapoor, to the show. Kamal, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me at last. I was thinking that, you know, when there's a time comes, when you say, hey, today you are on uh, the show. It happened by chance, but uh, I'm very excited here. Uh, very excited to be uh, to talk freely. You know, all the husbands there relate to me how many times you get a chance to speak freely in front of your other half. So thank you. Yes, of course. So now, even though our originally scheduled guest, Ashton Young, couldn't join us today, we actually decided to stick with the topic of self-love to chat about on the show today. So here on Take the Lead, a consciousness movement, the goal we're trying to accomplish each week is to bring awareness and consciousness to people to wake up and really come into their true, authentic selves, to embody their inner phenomenal leaders, and start to live their purpose. Now, I feel and personally have found that self-love is crucial, is a crucial component to being able to do this. Now, one of my mottos that um, if you follow me, you hear me say all the time is you can only lead others as effectively as you lead yourself. And really, in order to do that, you can only lead yourself if you know yourself. And in order to know yourself, you first have to love yourself. So I'd love to first define this topic of self-love and then break it down by looking at some awesome stats that we found from a study from Gitnik's market data report from actually this year, 2024, which I came across in preparation for this discussion today. So before we get to some of those, let me tell you are some very interesting stats. Let's first define what self-love is. So self-love is the practice of accepting, respecting, and valuing yourself. It's the foundation of a healthy relationship with yourself and involves a deep level of care and compassion towards yourself. Now, this involves understanding your emotions, your needs, and your desires, and also being able to prioritize them without feeling guilt or shame. Self-love is a journey of personal growth and development that requires practice, kindness, and forgiveness towards yourself. 
yourself. And at the core of self-love is self-awareness, which allows you to identify your strengths, your weaknesses, and your limitations. Now, through self-awareness, you can establish healthy boundaries, make better life choices, and take responsibilities for your actions. Self-love also involves self-care, which encompasses taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally. And I would also add to that energetically and spiritually as well, because this is actually what I call the five core human components. And it's something that I teach as a basis of recognizing and embodying your inner phenomenal leader. And this can be achieved through activities like exercise, healthy eating and meditation. Ultimately, self-love is about recognizing your worth and celebrating yourself unapologetically. So come on, what are your thoughts on self-love? Self-love? I thought you were going to ask me about myself, what I do, my business, but you're <laughs> asking me about self-love, huh? Tricky, tricky question. But since you ask me, here is my take on self-love. I think I believe self-love is important in everyday life because it sets the tone for how we treat ourselves and ultimately how we interact with uh, others. I believe when we love and respect ourselves, we are more likely to make uh, healthy choices, set boundaries, communicate effectively. What, does, what it does, it creates healthier relationships and more positive impact on society. These, these are my beliefs, you know, and I also believe since we are on social media 24 seven, basically 24 seven, what we do first thing in the morning, we go out, we reach out to our phones and look for uh, what's happening on social media. But uh, self-love plays an essential part in combating the negative effects of social media and societal pressure. I believe the bombardment of unrealistic standards and societal expectations, we, we all struggle. We struggle and uh, self-doubt and uh, we have you know, sometimes low self-esteem. But if we regularly practice self-love by taking care of ourselves, we can counteract these negative influences and develop a more realistic, positive self-image. My thoughts. Very awesome. Some great insights and nuggets of wisdom you've just dropped on us. So that's amazing. Thank you. So let's go ahead and talk about the stats that I was talking about. So the first stat that we have is that 44% of people believe that self-love is an important aspect of mental health. Now, I definitely agree with this. Now, as um, our viewers know, I've written two books. So they're over here. Two books on mindset. Uh, so I have definitely found in my own journey that mindset is is hugely important. And really, before I discover what mindset truly is and just how deep it goes, I had no idea just how powerful our minds are and just how much they can hinder us and hold us back from accomplishing things and being who we truly are um, if we aren't aware of what our mindset is doing um, within our psyche and within our lives. So I personally, um, you know, find this statistic very encouraging that, uh, you know, almost half of people around the world believe that self-love is an important aspect of mental health. Any thoughts from you on that, Kamal? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you're right. Uh, the statics, you know, it, it says clearly 44% of people. So uh, what happened in, um, we all know, the uh, one of the effect of the pandemic, people start realizing that self-love is very, very important for their mental health. They were like, you know, they are in, in the room sometimes, they are not uh, meeting anybody, not even their family members. So by taking care of them and, and uh, by, basically, you know, taking care of the mental health is very, very important in this uh, time of our life. Uh, more of the more stuff we are doing, what we're doing, we are not doing many things physically, but we are doing everything mentally. And we are on the phone, telephones, uh, you know, laptops, computers, whatever. But these, so in that case, mental health is very, very important. I definitely agree. I definitely think that the, I agree with you that the pandemic really did shed some light uh, on lots of things in regards to what's important, our priorities and how we go about life. And definitely during that time, you know, we weren't, we weren't able to get away from ourselves. So we were really stuck with ourselves. So yes, it definitely helped us to self-reflect and cause us to really introspect and, and learn more about ourselves. So let's go ahead and go to the next stat. 
Yeah, um, I believe this is the sec other one which actually caught my eye. 64% of people believe self-love has a positive impact on their overall lo lives. Self-love again, 64% of people. This is like a very, very high percentage, but I'm very happy I'm, you know, and, and uh, glad, glad that all the people, more and more people, uh, you know, realizing that how important it is. What are your thoughts? Yes, I definitely agree. I, I actually am, again, surprised by this high number. 64% of people believe self-love has positive impact on their overall lives. I'm very, again, encouraged to see that people have that awareness that self-love does is, is that crucial and has that much of an impact on their overall lives. So I definitely am encouraged um, by this statistic. Uh, but there's a couple of other statistics that I kind of want to connect to this um, to actually, you know, kind of really dive deeper into maybe where people really are in regards to self-love, even though they know that it has such a huge impact. But like, for instance, this next statistic, which is one in three people globally struggle with self-acceptance and self-value. So again, it, it looks like people understand that self-love is important and that it highly impacts their overall lives but still this huge number of one in every three people worldwide struggle with self-acceptance and self-value so again we are struggling to really get to know ourselves create that self-awareness but most importantly love ourselves so accept ourselves and find the value and worth that we actually have as individuals and i know that um kamal you have a a very interesting um very thoughtful uh, thought provoking thought in regards to us kind of wearing masks so can you uh, shed some light on that yeah so <clears throat> as as we know like you know people really struggle with self-acceptance what happened is when you're growing up uh, as a as a kid and you're growing up in your household, you tend to behave in a certain way and, and then some people around you uh, tend to uh, give you importance on, on that particular way of uh, behaving. So knowingly, unknowingly, actually you wear that mask. And then once you are trapped in that mask, so what you do, you keep on doing exactly the same things over and over, over and over. Uh, by doing that, sometimes actually, you know inside uh, these things may or may not be correct. These things are not helping them to grow, uh, to, to take care of their themselves and also taking care of uh, the people around you. But since they are struck in this uh, mask, they are very, very afraid to take that mask out, out of them. So um, it, it is very difficult. That is why they need someone, someone uh, you know, a leader, a teacher, a coach, to, uh, to make them realize this is not what you are. This is what your personality is. And what personality is, people think personality is a physical attribute, but it's not. Personality is basically how you act, how you react, and uh, you know the, the mask actually you're wearing. So they need someone to, uh, to make them realize, take out that mask and be free, be free in this world. Right, right. Yeah, I definitely love how you're bringing up the concept of masks, because as you were saying, it's really become, you know, we, we all have been wearing masks or sometimes, you know, are juggling between masks because it's what is expected of us of how we talk and behave, what we say, how we look. Um, things like that. I, I mean, especially I know from my days back in being a healthcare manager, I definitely was molded into how my upper management and my directors wanted me to be in terms of a manager. And I very much felt like I was wearing a mask and wasn't really given the opportunity to really be my true authentic self. And I think that a lot of people are experiencing that uh, but may not be aware that that's what's happening, but most importantly, how to break out of that and so that they can stop wearing the masks and really, you know, put their true authentic selves forward in the world and feel confident and strong in being able to do that. So I love that we're having that type of uh, conversation in regards to this. I think it's a very important. So what, what's the next statistic that we want to look at? I think uh, this is the one, 78% of people think their self-love is not good as others. Again, self-doubt on their self-love, not recognizing what they can do 
and how they can improve themselves. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I actually found this statistic interesting when I came across it. It's that, you know, 78% of people think that their self-love is not as good as others. The first thought that came to mind is that, you know, I'm a big advocate on not comparing yourself to others because I always am, you know, talking to my clients about um, when they're comparing themselves to others, they're not comparing apples to apples. You know, you are, we are, indivi we are individuals and unique in our experience of life and uh, the path that we're on. So when you're comparing yourself to somebody else, when you're saying, oh, I don't think I love myself as much as this other person is, instead of paying attention to that other person and being worried about your level of self-love in comparison to theirs, you really look at yourself and concentrate on you loving yourself. Because again, you don't know what that other person's life experience has been and where, what they've been through in order to get to that level of self-love that you feel is superior to yours. You know, they might be um, reading tons of self-development books. They might have been through lots of experiences where they've had the opportunity to grow personally and um, improve in their self-love uh, practice and be able to see their self-worth and accept themselves. So again, you're never comparing apples to apples when you compare yourself with somebody else. So yeah, when I first saw this statistic, my first thought was stop comparing yourself. Just worry about you loving on you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the other one that I wanted to touch on is that, where did it go? I know the one, you probably know which one I'm looking for. The one- that An easy one for me, please. Ah, here we go. So 13% of women say they practice self-love regularly compared to 5% of men. Now, I already know from being a woman that it's very hard for us to practice self-love regularly. Um, you know, we just, I've, we have, you know, I feel like we're conformed uh, by society and, and being and behaving certain ways and always having that maternal instinct of everybody and everything comes before ourselves and taking care of ourselves and things like that. But really what surprised me about this statistic was that only 5% of men practice self-love regularly. So tell me, since you are a male, why is it that that percentage is so small? We just don't have time. There's so much going around us. <laughs> <laughs> we don't think about this self-love. Uh, but <clears throat> since, yeah, uh, I, I think 5% of men uh, practice regularly self-love. It is a very, very small percentage as compared to women because I think, you know, uh, people think women are more emotional, but I believe, uh, I think, and, and there are more and more studies coming out that men are also very emotional. But the problem is, since we are in this society and society is working for ages, for millennials, for, you know, thousands of years, uh, when a male child, a uh, boy is growing up, so they say, you know, be tough, be, do this, boy, don't cry, boys don't do this. So in order for them to uh, do, you know, to self-love, they have to show the emotions. They have to show that they care for themselves. But sometimes uh, when, you know, they show that they care for themselves, people think this person is very egoistic or, uh, you know, he's all about himself. I, me, myself, and that's it. That's what people think, but that's not the case. That is the case sometimes. I'm not, you know, uh, denying that fact, but that's not the case half time. So the problem is again, men are emotional, but they are not expressive. They need to work on this uh, trait. And uh, I believe uh, after this show, you know, they may think about it and uh, act accordingly. Yeah, I think you bring up a couple of great points there, especially about men actually are emotional. I know when back when I was in healthcare, the healthcare industry, and I was managing sp uh, surgical specialty departments, I had more male physicians than women. And going into that role, I thought, you know, I was going to have uh, an easier time working with my male physicians, and maybe the females were going to be a little bit harder. Because, you know, again, like you pointed out, um, it's this misconception that women are mo more emotional than men. But I actually found quite the opposite when I was um, a healthcare manager working with my physicians. The male physicians were 
way more um, outright, more emotional than the women. And it wasn't in a good way. Um, you know, whenever they were put in stressful situations or put under pressure, which as a surgeon, that's constantly, I um, mean, they were always on call. So the, the men tended to have these, you know, emotional outbursts and things like that, which again, wasn't healthy for them or for the people that they were taking that out on. And like, that really, um, you know, has us talking about the uh, awareness of the impact that what you say and how you behave, what impact that has on other people. Because most of the time when that happened, uh, it wasn't the impact they had on the staff. It wasn't in a good way. Um, but then again, um, I was really surprised to find that the physicians that were female that I had in my departments tended to be more even keel and were able to handle uh, you know, adverse situations much more better than the male physician. So um, I think that's interesting that you kind of mentioned that. And then the other thing Thing that I wanted to point out is that how you were talking about where it's not really uh, societally acceptable for men to show that they are emotional because that's seen as a weakness. I know I've talked to, I've spoken to a few uh, podcast hosts that um, are male and we've gotten into that conversation a few times, you know, especially in regards to um, men really bringing awareness to mental health struggles that they're having or, you know, um, overcoming grief um, and those types of challenges and really not feeling like they're able to fully express themselves and be genuine and authentic and transparent because of that societal, um, you know, kind of uh, expectation that you're not supposed to be as a male emotional because that's a sign of a weakness. So, yeah. So, um, do you have something else, or I, I have one one you know just an example here. I see uh, we maybe we talked about this before. One in three people globally struggle with self acceptance and self value. Mm -hmm. So um, it just came to my mind while we're talking. So. Everybody flies, everybody flies in the plane. So what happened is uh, they show you in the beginning, in case of emergency, when the uh, oxygen mask drop, what do you do? You should put mask on yourself first. What does it mean? You know, self-value, value yourself first, okay. and then take care of others. What does it mean? It means if you are capable, if you are capable enough to help other people, you can help more than one person. Believe me, without oxygen, you can help one person, maximum two, but then after you have to put oxygen mask on. So if you self-value yourself, you put the mask on and then keep on helping all the other people around you, you know, that's what they are telling you. And this is basically self-value. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with that. So one of the things that I wanted to look at is a very interesting a stat that came up in the study is 48% of millennials think that social media negatively impacts self-love, which was a little bit shocking to me, because especially since that generation tends to be on social media the most, and that they're actually aware, almost half of millennials are aware that social media negatively impacts self-love, but yet they still do it. So what are your thoughts on that? Everybody knows, basically, Not I'm not saying everybody knows, most of the people know that how social media negatively uh, impacts self-love. What happened is because of the uh, social media, uh, the, the more and more you are on social media, the social media is increasing, your interest in increasing, the, the, uh, there is a decrease in uh, physical activities. There's a, you know, social media is increasing, but social activities are decreasing. People are not meeting with each other. People, you know, the families are not eating dinner on the dinner table. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole idea of eating dinner, all, you know, everyone together is to meet, basically. It's not the food only, it's to meet, to talk, what you did all day, what you think, uh, what you're going to do tomorrow. So that is basically, uh, very negligible nowadays. So that also, uh, because, you know, we are human beings. Human beings are social animals. It's, it's, they say they're social animals. You need to speak to people in order to express yourself. Sometimes, you know, I see this, uh, why bars are very, very, uh, you know, popular. Why people go to the bars? Because it's not only drink, you meet people, you talk, you know, you talk to strangers. That's open your eyes and mind. You feel good about it. 
and then you go back home and and you know start doing things i'm not saying go to the bar all the time because you're drinking all the time but to increase your social gathering you know you can go to a social gathering and and uh, get away from this social media it's not very uh, easy to do that but uh, you know we can all try right right yeah i mean i definitely think that you know social media the creation of it has has some, you know, benefits. It, you were able to stay informed, uh, you know, like at the to the second of current events that are happening around the world. But again, it has also created this, you know, new kind of normal way of always being on social media versus like you're saying, really having human to human interaction and conversations like we used to, you know, decades before. I know, I know that you know, because you're my husband, but one of my pet peeves is when we go to restaurants and we see these people sitting across the table from one another having dinner and they're both on their phones. <laughs> I can't stand that it's like you know you went out to have a nice dinner enjoy the conversation and enjoy each other instead of being on your phone 24 <laughs> 7 you know so so yeah I yeah mean, you know the uh, as you said the uh, the creators of social media if you talk to them what was the reason behind to create a social media to get people more social you know, the social media is social media to get more social, uh, meet more people, you know. But what happened is because it's online, people are more isolated now. Right. The more you're on social media, the more you're isolated. It, it becomes, it's a side effect. But what happened at the end of the day, the side effect becomes more stronger than the actual outcome. So that is what is happening. We, we cannot live without it, but you cannot live with it. It's just the way it is. Exactly, exactly. So there are uh, three of these uh, statistics that I find in conjunction when you kind of look at them all together are really interesting. So the first one is this one we actually took a look at a couple of times. So one in three people globally struggle with self-acceptance and self-value in connection with this one, where 13% of women say they practice self-care regularly compared to only 5% of men. And then this last one, where 44% of people believe self-love is an important aspect of mental health. So what was really, really interesting to me when I kind of saw the three of these statistics in order in the uh, the data survey that uh, this came from is that, you know, again, 44%, almost half of people believe that self-love is important to mental health, yet only 13% of women practice it and only 5% of men practice it. And one in three people globally struggle with self-awareness or self-acceptance and self-value, which is a crucial component to self-love. So this really, when I read this, uh, the question that immediately popped to my mind is, is this contributing to the global mental health crisis that we have been experiencing for the past few years and it continues to grow? What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, definitely. It is actually, um, you know, really, uh, really contributing to uh, this aspect of our life. Uh, the the mental health is uh, deteriorating. Uh, yeah, social media is, is one of the reasons, but there are other reasons, too like lack of families, lack of, you know, uh, the guidance and uh, there is, you know, lack of faith. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea of going to the temples or mosque or churches is, again, you know, there is a guidance. There's a guidance from maybe uh, someone who's older than you. There's a guidance from, you know, the, uh, the church members. So uh, and then people, when they are together, they tend to ask sometimes questions that this is what is happening. You may not get the answer yourself because, again, uh, your criteria is very small. Your circle is very small. And, and our, our mind will work in a very, very a strange way. If you want to do something, the mind is going to come back to you. This is dangerous. You want to do something else, the mind, the mind is going to come back to you and say, hey, this is a little risky. So every day you try to do something, but your mind will work against it. You know, but, but again, this is where uh, you know, the self-love is an important aspect. You know, you, you need to do that. You need to practice. Uh, you need to uh, practice. There is a lot of other ways to do this. Once you're able to um, uh, understand who you are and stop devaluing yourself most of the time, you know, you go for an interview, uh, someone is giving you a pay of $10,000. I'm just saying it's very high. 
but ten thousand dollars, you take it. You never tend to say, "Hey, uh, my, my, you know, I think uh, I am capable of doing these, so I need, uh, you know, twelve thousand. But no, whatever you get, you take it. So do you devalue yourself? Uh, this is another part of our lives. Uh, for that reason, again, forty-four percent of the people believe self-love is an important aspect of mental health. I, I believe in that. Yeah, yeah, I think you uh, touched on some some you know uh, really good points there, especially that as we can see from this particular statistic, forty four percent of people, almost half, believe that self love is an important aspect of mental health. Yet we see the other uh, statistic where one in three people globally are struggling with self acceptance and self value. So the awareness seems to be there, but what seems to be missing is you know how do you get from that point A to point B where you're struggling to accept yourself and love yourself and recognize yourself and value yourself, but you know that uh, that is a crucial aspect of mental health, but you just don't know how to cross that bridge. So like you're saying, there's that guidance that's missing, that knowledge that typically gets passed down generation to generation, and that we are taught to be able to recognize these types of things and grow into first of all, discovering who we truly and authentically are and being proud of that and, you know, not being afraid to be that type of person and stop wearing all of the masks. So, yeah, I think you you touched on a great point there that the awareness that it's important seems to be there, but it's, it's that bridge of how to get to that point to where you're actually practicing it that seems to be missing in our in our world in our society today so do you have any last thoughts for our viewers that are watching this uh episode on self-love as we have a couple minutes left love yourself love your neighbors love your family love uh, everyone around you and if there is a difficulty find a coach find a mentor you know, no matter in uh, where you are, you are a CEO or in a, a manager level or maybe a supervisor or just on an entry level, you know, find a coach, find a coach, find a mentor and uh, speak to them. And I hopefully they will let you know which path is a good path for you. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me and being a guest co-host and having this conversation on self-love with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Help me in thanking Kamal for being here and having this very insightful and thoughtful conversation with us today. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, I hope to come back again and, and talk about some <laughs> of the stuff. Uh, stand in uh, guest today. I'm also very excited because I'm playing a double role today. As you know, our technician didn't show up. So I'm in front of the camera and uh, back of the camera. This is very exciting. All right, everybody, thank you. Thanks very much. Bye now. Okay, so now, now, as you may remember, this particular segment is about helping you intentionally set your agendas for the next day to help you find your daily rhythm and set daily intentions that align with your overall goals and aspirations. Now, to help you move beyond the mundanity of daily routines and to actively engage in your life with more purpose and control. So last time we explored this particular segment, I assigned you an exercise of reflecting your goals on your goals to help you gain clarity on your priorities and align your day-to-day -day activities with your overarching desires. Now, you were to take a week or so to work on this exercise so that we can take it even deeper over the next few weeks. So now that you've spent some time reflecting on your short-term and your long-term goals, let's now use your newfound awareness and consciousness to prioritize your daily tasks around your goals. Now, to further assist you in this endeavor, I recommend an exercise that I personally do daily. Now, at the end of each day, I take a few moments to reflect on what I've been able to accomplish and what things I still have outstanding for the day. 
Now, based on what I've determined from my goals, which you can, um, based on what you determined from your goals reflection exercise that you've done, identify one to three specific baby goals that you want to achieve the following day that will progress you forward towards your overarching goals. Now, these are essentially your top one to three daily priorities. Now, I personally have found that I am unable to complete more than three major tasks per day. Therefore, I don't recommend that you try to do more than that. Otherwise, you'll be setting yourself up for overwhelm, frustration, and ultimately disappointment. Now, once you've identified your daily priorities, be sure to write them down in your journal or planner or on your calendar. This will help you to stay focused and accountable throughout the day. Now, as you work throughout your daily tasks, periodically refer back to your daily priorities as well as your overarching goals to ensure that you are staying on track. Now, at the end of the day, take a few moments to reflect on your progress. Be sure to celebrate your accomplishments and your successes, as well as take some time to learn from your opportunities to improve as well. Now, use this reflection to create your priorities for the following day. Now, imp by implementing this exercise, you'll begin to cultivate a daily rhythm that aligns with your overall goals and aspirations. You will become more intentional with your time and energy, and you will feel more in control of your life. So take the time to prioritize your daily tasks around your goals and watch as you move closer towards realizing your dreams. Now, if you'll remember in this segment, the purpose of it is to really take the concept of setting up your daily groove, which we just talked about, to the next level. Now, when we are intentional and let our mind know what types of things we need to work on the next day, it will actually problem solve so that you immediately have the solutions and ideas you need to tackle your projects head on the next day while you're sleeping. Now, this segment offers a unique approach to personal growth and empowerment where you'll learn how to tap into the power of your subconscious mind and use it to manifest your deepest desires. So today, in conjunction with your assignment for setting your daily groove of prioritizing your next day tasks based on your overarching goals, I want you to also try something that I also personally do myself. Now, that is don't end your work day and definitely don't go to bed without knowing exactly what it is you intend to do the next day like we just talked about. You see, I found that there is a power as well as a certain degree of calmness, if you will, in already having your agenda for the next day all planned out. Like I mentioned before, when you know your goals that you are pursuing and attaining to achieve, if you know your priorities in conjunction with your goals for the next day and you've defined them before your bed or your, your, your bed, your head hits the pillow, you allow your mind to assist you in accomplishing your daily priorities and overarching goals by working ahead or getting a jump start while you're sleeping, recharging, refueling, and rejuvenating. So give these two exercises a try over the next two weeks or so, and then see what happens. I have a feeling that you will be pleasantly surprised at your own progress. All right, and there you have it, my amazing, phenomenal leaders, as this episode of Take the Lead, a consciousness movement with Angelique Kapoor comes to a close. I want to thank my guest co-host today, the fabulous Kamal Kapoor, for joining us on the show. Wasn't he just fabulous, y'all? And also, thank you, you beautiful soul, for being here with us today, too. You might recall that I do not believe in coincidences. Therefore, you, Bright Light, were meant to be here today to receive whatever message you were meant to receive today from this episode. So keep at it because consistency is key. Keep showing up, keep loving on yourself, and making progress on your journey to becoming the phenomenal leader I know that you are truly meant to be. 
Now, be sure to join me next week because I'll have another absolutely inspiring guest joining us. Now, for our episode next week on April 15th, a fellow E360 TV TV show host, Jeff Pearson of Invisible Condition, will be joining me to chat about living with a chronic mental condition, medical condition that is invisible to others. I have a couple of those myself, so I'll be including that in our discussion as well. Now, more intriguing, though, is that Jeff will share his story of learning to thrive with his condition called water on the brain, a condition that affects his daily life, but is often misunderstood by others. During our conversation, I expect that we'll discover the power or we'll explore the power of mindset, resilience, and self-compassion in living with chronic illness. So it'll be another conversation that you won't want to miss. So be sure to set your reminders to be back here with me next Monday April 15th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. All right, my beautiful, phenomenal leaders, have a great week, and I will see you next Monday. Take care. Coming up next week on Take the Lead, a consciousness movement with Angelique Moore. Guest Jeff Pearson shares his journey of learning to thrive with water on the brain. Don't miss next week's episode on E360 TV.